uh, is intelligent design science. That, that is uh, a subject that has occupied uh, uh, a lot of space in, uh, and time, and uh, cyberspace has its uh, own version of that. And uh, having participated in some of those discussions, I've seen some of the arguments and the counter-arguments. And what I'm trying to do right now is to present something that uh, basically nullifies some of the, what I consider, red herrings that are sometimes drawn across this uh, area and present uh, uh, a kind of core claim of intelligent design in as simple a way as possible. Uh, the video will only take 10 minutes, so you'll have lots of time to discuss it. Uh, and I'm not going to say too much more about it once it's there, but uh, uh, I'll be interested in your feedback as to what the uh, video has, uh, how you perceive it, and um, whether it's worth the effort and whether it uh, can be improved. And so with that, I'm going to start with uh, trying to get the video uh, started and uh, semi-coordinated with the audio, which is, uh, uh, it'll follow a somewhat familiar format to those of you who've been here before. Let's see. I want Excuse me, that's wrong. I don't know is intelligent is. designs. There we go. Now, uh, why that did that, I don't know. But I guess that's one of the things that happens when you're trying to do this. Um, is intelligent design science. Intelligent design advocates claim they are doing science and that their ideas are scientific. On the other hand, opponents of intelligent design claim that it's just not science, it's pseudoscience. Who is right? To answer that question, we have to know what science is. Most of us were taught the scientific method. We make a hypothesis about how nature behaves. We test it in the laboratory or perhaps by observation. If it fails to match our observations, we throw it out or modify it and test it again. If it succeeds, we test it against further observations. And if our hypothesis succeeds multiple times without failing, it is elevated to the status of theory. We used to think that a theory could become a law, never needing any revision. But we have discovered that almost all of the laws we thought we knew are subject to revision. Boyle's law, Charles' law, the law of the conservation of matter, even Newton's law of gravity have all had to be modified. The only surviving laws are the laws of thermodynamics. And who knows, someday they may turn out to have exceptions. One of the lessons from this is that there is no sacrosanct theory in science. All theories must be regarded as open to revision. The next point is more subtle. Science can only study phenomena that are in some sense reproducible. For in order to be tested, a theory must predict that future events will behave in the same basic way as past events. That is why experiments that are done at one time and place can be representative of and predict events that happen at another time and place. So science requires reproducibility. This gives a certain advantage of science over other fields of study. It allows for a check on scientific claims. If the data are not reproducible, the claims are unverified and not part of science. Science is self-correcting in a way that is not open to other disciplines such as history. One cannot, for example, refight the Battle of Waterloo to find out what happened. So let us take this as the fundamental definition of science. Science is the study of the reproducible. With this definition in mind, we return to our question, is intelligent design science? In one sense, the answer is trivial. 
While there are some phenomena that can be found in nature that may or may not involve an intelligent designer or designers, there are other phenomena that have never been seen without the input of at least one intelligent designer. Examples include computers and airliners. If we managed to get to Alpha Centauri and found a computer or an airliner there, even, perhaps especially, if it did not look like the ones we make, we would have reason to believe that there was or had once been, if not a civilization, at least an intelligence there. This much is uncontroversial. So in theory, intelligent design is a part of science. What about the claims of modern-day intelligent design advocates? As we noted at the beginning, there are a lot of claims and counterclaims that are made about intelligent design. And sorting through those claims is a major project. But we can note that there is one central claim with which all intelligent design advocates agree. It is that the results of an intelligent designer or designers not only can be detected, but have been detected on Earth before the advent of modern humans. It is this claim that we will examine now. There are four propositions that seem to me to rationally support such a claim. They are as follows. A. Humans are intelligent. Intelligence may not be limited to humans. Beavers presumably show a rudimentary intelligence, as do other animals, and it is possible that there are other organisms or entities, perhaps on other planets on other star systems, that also exhibit or have exhibited intelligence. But at least humans have intelligence. The denial of this proposition has certain unavoidable negative self-referential implications. In other words, the human claiming that humans are not intelligent is claiming not to be intelligent himself or herself as the case may be. B. Humans have produced long strings of DNA, long enough and complex enough and accurate enough so that they can function as the major information storage system for a cell. That is, they can replace the DNA normally used in a cell. The immediate corollary is that at least some intelligences are capable of making such long, complex, functionally specified strings of DNA. C. There is no experimental evidence that nature, without significant intelligent input, is able to produce such long, complex, functionally specified strings of DNA. That is, nobody has put unstructured chemicals into a system applied heat, cosmic rays, and or ultraviolet radiation, and found long strings of DNA, let alone long, complex, functionally specified strings of DNA, inside. D. There is no persuasive theory that can explain how such long, complex, functionally specified strings of DNA might have been made in nature without significant intelligent input. The best theory the RNA world suffers from three major defects. One, the precursors of RNA are exceedingly hard to produce using natural processes and even harder to keep from degenerating once they are produced. Two, the current status of the RNA world is very incomplete with no evidence of a smooth progression from simpler to more complex. And three, there is no evidence that any hypothetical completed complex RNA organism would also be selected to code for protein and thus transition to modern DNA-based protein-using organisms. And the RNA world is the best current non-intelligent design theory. Conclusion. If one is to go on the evidence available today, the more reproducible scenario and therefore the more scientific scenario is to say that if we find long, complex, functionally specified strings of DNA in living organisms, then they most likely arose by the action of an intelligent designer. 
We do find such strings ubiquitously in living organisms, and so it is reasonable to tentatively conclude that there is an intelligent designer or designers that have been active on Earth. Since by all accounts, life preceded human activity here on Earth, this suggests a non-human, or at least non-earthly human, intelligent designer. Thus, the major assertion of intelligent design has scientific support. Note what is not being said. There is no claim to infallibility. For example, Proposition B could be false. It could turn out that Craig Venter and company were really incompetent or frauds. I really doubt it, but stranger things have happened. It could turn out that with further experimentation, Proposition C could fail, or perhaps in the next few years, Proposition D would fail and a persuasive theory will emerge to show how life could reasonably have arisen from nature without intelligence. Proposition A seems necessary to carry on the conversation. One can even have faith that one or the other of these propositions will turn out to be false, in which case the conclusion would be invalid unless it has support from elsewhere. But it does seem that if one goes with the presently available scientific data, intelligent design is science. Notice that nothing in the basic argument says anything about a god, and the argument is not dependent on such an entity. Nevertheless, the usual immediate objection to such an argument is that God either does not exist or does not act contrary to the laws of nature and thus would not intervene, or that bringing God into the discussion is not scientific. But the argument is not dependent on God, at least no more than all of nature is dependent on God, and it is not legitimate to base a scientific argument on belief about God. One has to face the evidence, regardless of one's theological or anti-theological prejudices. Given the available evidence we have, intelligent design is within the realm of science and appears to be the best current explanation for certain scientific data. And that's the end. So, uh, I invite your comments. I came in a little late, so I might have missed it, but in order to be scientific, my understanding is it needs to be reproducible and needs to be refutable. And I was wondering if intelligent design fits either of those two categories. Well, uh, reproducibility is a form of testability. That is to say, if you do something and you get one answer one time and you get another answer another time and you get a third answer the third time, and no matter how many times you repeat it, you don't get the same results. At that point, you're not dealing with uh, uh, something that's uh, testable or repeatable. And it may be true, but it would definitely fall outside of the, the bounds of science. I'd, I'd like to go back to the um, question that was just raised. Um, as I understand it, scientific method requires um, that the positive evidence, which I think is another way of saying repeatability, that if you add up the positive evidence, uh, that it's heavily weighted on the side that you are attempting to establish. I think what you've done here is say that there is a great deal of negative evidence, that is, nobody has any alternative methods of, of doing something. And I, I don't think that that constitutes uh, typically accepted proof in science. And let me give you an illustration. There are, uh, there is uh, something known as a barrel vault that um, occurs in a lot of buildings that were built 
uh, at the time of the Romans. When uh, in after the Dark Ages, which is basically a, a an arch that continues. Yeah, it's a it's an arch that's uh, that's extended uh, in a lengthwise direction. Uh, after the Middle Ages, when people tried to reproduce this, they couldn't, and um, turned out to be impossible to build a barrel vault by building walls and then starting up to. And then at some subsequent point, it was discovered that what the Romans did was that they they made a mold, um, an arch out of wood or something like that. Then they put the bricks on top of that. And once the whole structure had solidified, they could take the, the scaffolding away, and now we've got a barrel vault. So um, here was an attempt to get at an outcome that turned out to be impossible to achieve without some third element coming. Now, I don't know whether that's um, directly applicable here, but I don't think that you can prove something scientifically on the basis of negative evidence because the, the answer always could be, well, we don't know how to do it yet, but, and this is of course where RNA th hypothesis came from, but we may be able to do it at some point in the future. It may turn out to be relatively straightforward, but right now the scaffolding has um, gotten lost and we didn't know that there we don't know that there is scaffolding. I'm just saying that there's a possibility that something like that may exist. Well, actually, um, there, there are a couple of good points that you're making. One of them is that, um, uh, that a uh, structure that is currently irreducibly complex, you take out a certain number of bricks and the whole thing caves in, uh, might not have been irreducibly complex when it was being made. Uh, that you start out by building an arch. Um, I had thought of just simply filling the, the place up with earth and then putting the bricks on and then digging out the earth afterwards. Um, but the scaffolding, of course, is a lot uh, easier, probably less uh, labor intensive. Um, uh, but that's, that's true for any kind of, whether it's an arch or a barrel vault. Uh, they're, they're currently irreducibly complex. Um, at the time they were made, they obviously couldn't be. Uh, one of the gifts of intelligent designers is to think of ways to take care of the problems of building something that, uh, uh, that eventually uh, they want to have a, an irreducibly complex uh, and uh, aesthetically pleasing uh, 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 final structure without having that, uh, uh, you know, obviously you can't have that initially because uh, you couldn't have people sliding in all the bricks at the same time. Um, that is actually a, an objection that is used for uh, the creation of life itself. That's a valid one. You can say, that no, we don't know of any way of creating life by natural means. But then intelligent designers haven't been able to create life either, so uh, who knows how it was done. And that's precisely the reason why I restricted the conversation to long strings of DNA. I didn't, uh, I didn't say life. And the reason why is because it is open to that kind of objection. On the other hand, for long strings of DNA, we do know that intelligent designers are capable of doing that now. So um, I think that the one technical criticism you could make is well, only one person has done it. Um, I don't think that's a very big objection. I doubt that Craig, Craig Venter is the only person that is able to create a consortium that's able to reproduce uh, long strings of DNA that will work in a cell. Uh, and I don't think I'm going to get too many objections to that particular point. But the idea of being able to make those things, um, that says that intelligent designers are capable of making long strings of DNA, whereas uh, natural forces, as far as we know, do not. 
And that's the strength of this particular argument, which is different from the other argument. Uh, that whole thing is kind of a, a little bit of a farce. And I'll tell you why. Uh, Richard Dawkins starts out The Blind Watchmaker by saying that uh, biology is the study of organisms that look like they're designed. I'm slightly mutilating the quote, but it, it, I'm approximating pretty closely. Um, uh, George Gaylord Simpson says that, you know, a telescope, uh, various other things like that, are, look like they're designed. Uh, biological structures look like they're designed. Um, uh, Dawkins goes on to say in The Blind Wet Watchmaker that basically his job is to persuade you, uh, and he thinks he has, that natural processes can produce those kinds of designs and that therefore an, a designer is not necessary. But to say that is not to say that there isn't positive evidence for design. It's screaming out at us. It's only when we try to ignore that by saying, but we can explain it some other way, that you can actually get there. And so to say that intelligent design um, uh, is a negative argument is really not fair. It hasn't been fair for a long time. But in this case, it's completely unfair because we actually have intelligent designers that can do this. We know it can be done using intelligent design, at least as far as long strings of DNA are concerned. Well, I, I agree that um, uh, what you've said is, in fact, the case. But it seems to me you need to go further. Um, take, for instance, bones. If you do a cross-section, say, of the long bone of the leg, you will discover that uh, the structure of that is beautifully designed to be rigid, you know, minimal weight, and um, we know how that's done because we know that throughout life the bone gets remodeled and as you walk on it, the stresses and strains are strengthened where the, um, the stresses are the greatest. The, the cells scurry there and, and they lay down more bone. You can do the same thing. An intelligent designer could design a bone and we do similar things when we design bridge struts and things like that. So you end up with the same sorts of outcomes. In one case, it is done naturally, and in another case, it's done by virtue of intelligent design. We know how the, we know how the bone remodels itself, so in this case, uh, we don't have to postulate an intelligent designer. Um, so the fact that um, humans can make long strings of DNA, and that in nature we see those long strings of DNA, is, I think, similar. It's just in the case of the bone, physiologically, I guess we've got an orthopedist back there who could comment on this maybe even more directly, but we know how that process works. And therefore, we don't, we don't impute an intelligent designer to the remodeling of bone. Well, I, I, I think that you're begging the question. You see, what you're saying is that life is part of nature. You're assuming that uh, living organisms can just simply come up naturally. Now once you get living organisms, they can do some very apparently intelligent things. And that's, by the way, another reason why I've restricted it to the origin of uh, the DNA necessary for life, is because you can make an argument that once you have living organisms, somehow they will do this. There are weaknesses in that argu uh, argument, uh, but it gets into some very technical uh, areas that are difficult for most people to understand. On the other hand, I think this is clear cut. You see, if you have living organisms, 
then either they came about by intelligent design or not. If they came about by intelligent design, then the fact that they have further designs in them is no surprise. If you start out by knowing that they came about without intelligent design, then to say that now they have these wonderfully designed things, uh, or designed looking, as uh, Dawkins would call them, designoid, uh, then you're, uh, uh, you know, you can try to save your, uh, yourself that way, but you still have to get to life before you get to the living organisms that do the wonderful things with bone. And I think you have to take it a step farther. In your argument that the bone automatically remodels itself, it this doesn't This is an orthopedist, by the way. Yeah, he, he recognizes my voice. It doesn't <laughs> automatically remodel. The, the cells, the osteocytes and the osteoblasts have genetic material in them and information systems that respond that, you would ar that I would argue has information that didn't spontaneously occur and therefore the design of those cells and the genetic material in those cells to respond to the stresses, to remodel the bone, to make it the most, is all there and you now, I think, make even a better argument for incredible design in that, that it would not, that information, genetic information and capability and systems to do that are evidence of a design. And one other, the, what I started to answer before he made his comment though is that it's amazing to me, it would seem to me that in medicine when I have a couple options and I'm trying to figure out an answer, I try and run the variables, both set of variables at the same time to see which one will help me arrive at an answer and understanding of what's going on. We have spent billions of dollars in restricted research in this country because we cannot tolerate the concept that there might be an intelligent design behind some of these things. And if you look at research, we spent an awful lot of money trying to ignore another possibility which might have given us answers that would have been helpful in science. And it was certainly helpful up until the last few decades to scientists in the past to have a faith. It was not restricting Newton, et cetera, that I know of the fact that he believed in the existence of God. And now we have actually, I think, if you were to look at it, have spent billions of dollars trying to prove a theory and ignoring another possibility which may have advanced science a lot faster to at least consider both at the same time in an open, scientific, fair fashion. I'm no scientist and unable to judge between one or another. But in our home, we have several dozen books on shelves that we have labeled intelligent design. We read those books, and, and they seem to have been written by scientists. They deal with the same material as the scientist deals with. They just have a little different take on the matter, everything from statistical probability to Astronomy, I hope I haven't been fooled in buying all these expensive books <laughs> that are totally worthless because they're not scientific. No, in my opinion, you haven't. Uh, uh, this is one area where I think we have to be very careful to stay within the evidence. And uh, there are people on the other side of the aisle who are happy to uh, uh, make sure that that happens. Um, but that doesn't mean that all of their criticisms are valid. I think that this is uh, an area where at present the information is very clearly in favor of intelligent design, both on the negative side and on the positive side. We can show how you can do it if you're smart. We cannot show how you can do it or how nature can do it without some kind of help. Uh, that doesn't mean that, uh, uh, and, and I think this is one difference between, the, uh, uh, between this kind of an argument and the God of the gaps. God of the gaps is simply there's a gap, therefore God. In this particular case, I think we can say that there's, uh, that there's reason to believe that with intelligence one can do things that one can't do without intelligence. And uh, I, I think Craig Vander has done a great favor to the intelligent design movement. Uh, and obviously not intentionally, but uh, I think it's still true. 
uh, coming back here eventually. I was just wondering um, if you, you get to the point that science does a accept uh, intelligent design, where does, he, where does science go after that? Do they look for spaceships, flying saucers? Because um, to be in science, you still have to stay within the physical world, right? I mean, as, as far as <laughs> the definition of the scope of science, so where do you go after that? Maybe that's why it's so, it's so unaccepted, because they don't know what to do with it after that. I, I think that there's a certain uh, a point to your comment uh, that, that people are afraid where this is going to go, and then where do you go from there, and does this destroy all of science? Um, I would say that there's, uh, there are two comments I would make. Number one is that, um, uh, actually maybe three, uh, see if I can remember them all now. Uh, number one is that um, uh, intelligent design can actually be helpful. Uh, the best example I can give you is the popularity of junk DNA, uh, which was very popular in the, uh, uh, if you want to call it that, the secular scientific realm for a while, uh, is becoming much less popular after uh, ENCODE, uh, and you can see, uh, ENCODE, I'm sorry, and you can see the, uh, uh, the remaining critics crying desperately that uh, ENCODE really hasn't proved anything when I think by reasonable it has shown what it needs to show. And uh, it's arguable that uh, close to 100% of the genome, in fact, is, is serving a purpose. Um, the second, uh, so, so that intelligent design does not mean the end of science. It may actually assist in some areas. That's number one. Uh, number two, I think there is more to life than, this, than science. I don't think that you can find out about historical events using science only. It is very possible that our science is too crude to be able to measure what happens when people uh, love each other. Um, uh, science is not necessarily going to be involved in the ability to select what great art is about. Um, there are a lot of things that have to do with uh, human existence where at least presently science is impotent. And it may always be impotent, for all we know. Uh, I think to assume that that's the case is, uh, to assume that science can, can answer everything, is to fall prey to scientism. And I think that uh, it, uh, it may very well turn out to be a false hope. Uh, but the third thing is, um, Ellen White once used the phrase, the science of salvation. If when we do certain things or we ask certain ways, and I don't pretend at this point to be able to tell you what all of those are, um, but uh, God is willing to act in certain ways, that then becomes reproducible but without a mechanism. Now one might argue that science also needs a mechanism, but I will point out to you that the best scientific theory we have right now, um, physics is the quintessential science, and quantum mechanics is the reigning theory in physics. And uh, if you were to ask a physicist what theory is likely to sur survive when all other theories fail, it wouldn't actually be relativity, it would be, um, it would be quantum mechanics. And yet, quantum mechanics has absolutely no discernible uh, and no even at present conceivable mechanism to make it work. 
It is done on the basis of mathematics. It's beautiful mathematics, but we have no clue as to what the mechanics are. Um, is, um, is a scientific method for detecting intelligent, intelligent action, uh, is, um, we're talking about it mostly in the context of, uh, of origins, but uh, what other fields would uh, benefit from such a, uh, a method? I can think of forensic science, I, I could imagine. Well, forensic science is full of it. Uh, and the interesting thing is in every other field, there's really no basic question. You know, if, if we got to, um, uh, if we got to Alpha Centauri and found a functioning airliner, uh, even if it didn't, like I say, especially if it didn't look like the ones we, mail, we build here, uh, there would be no question in anybody's mind that there had been some kind of intelligence there. Uh, most people would opt for material-based intelligence, aliens, uh, distinguishing between them and, let's say, God or Satan or somebody else would be a difficult task. Uh, but that there was some intelligence, I think, would be absolutely unquestioned by anybody. If we got to Mars and found it littered with arrowheads, uh, and arrowheads are relatively simple, we'd probably still draw the same conclusion. So exoarchaeology, shall we say, I mean, if that field exists, but, but what about uh, fields on Earth now and commonly practiced? Um, well, it, the, I mean, the detection of intelligent design is, is one that's uh, done in, in forensics all the time. It's done in archaeology plane. You dig up stuff and you think this earth just got there. You think that uh, these pottery shirts didn't just get there, they were made by somebody. And if you're being really, really technical, you might even be able to say that this particular bunch of red colored earth came from human activity rather than um, uh, getting washed in by the nearest arroyo or something. So we do that kind of thing on a, on a routine basis in a lot of disciplines. It's the implications of finding that, in fact, there's evidence for intelligent design before the advent of humans is where it gets really controversial. After the advent of humans, pretty much everybody accepts it. It's not a problem. It's, it, what, the problem really comes with uh, then where was the terrest and, uh, extraterrestrial and uh, is this a celestial being instead of a just plain extraterrestrial? A, a different question, but uh, you, you showed a, a PowerPoint presentation with the recorded audios. Was this just done for our benefit or are you producing something of avail making available else, you know, through uh, the internet? Well, uh, somebody could probably chop 10 minutes and 24 seconds out of this here and it had, they'd have themselves a presentation. But hopefully we'd like to make it better to where, uh, you know, uh, integrate more video kinds of things with it that would uh, make the point better. Uh, and for those of you who want to clear it up or, uh, you know, m make suggestions or I've got some film that would really fit in this area, I'm very much open to uh, any kind of help we can get. In fact, if you can find a better narrator, you can do that too. Uh, yes, and then back. Uh. Well, <coughs> excuse me. Apropos of your video, um, it I it would have been helpful to me if at the end there, instead of just referring to points A, B, and C, you would put them up there because I I couldn't remember what they were. That's a good point, and I think that that's one of the things that we'll probably do. Uh, but back to the uh, the question of junk DNA. I'm not aware, and I haven't been checking, uh, but are, do we know of, of people who actually were, the, the ones that did the ENCODE project, were they being driven by a belief in intelligent design, or were they just maintaining the curiosity of scientists and proceeding uh, on the grounds that if it's here, it probably serves some useful purpose? Do, do we have evidence that intelligent design actually drove one or more of these people? Well, the ideal thing to do, of course, would be to run two experiments on two separate worlds. 
uh, one in which intelligent design advocates have a major input uh, starting about 19, maybe 1985, 1990, when intelligent design advocates were starting to say things like this, and let them direct some of the funding towards looking for that. Uh, and then uh, run another world where the intelligent design advocates were completely squashed, and then run a third world, our own, for controls, where, uh, and we see f which one discovered uh, uh, function for DNA first, and how much, and, uh, and where our world fits in that continuum between the two ideals. Unfortunately, we're not able to do that. So the, I, I suppose the best you can do is look at how long did it take, um, who did it, what their uh, preferences were, and I'm not sure that I have enough data to be able to answer that question with any kind of uh, uh, security. It does seem intuitive that if people think there's a function, they're more likely to look for it than if people think it's, there isn't one. Well, I, I agree. I was just curious if we know of any one of the ENCODE scientists that was driven by that. Because I've heard this reference to junk DNA and the fact that um, uh, a fair number of um, people said we don't believe that the good Lord makes junk DNA but and that uh, the inference then is that this drove the ENCODE scientists to look at junk DNA to see if but I don't think at least I've not seen any evidence that that is in fact what happened do you, do you know of any evidence was any one or group of these people driven by that did they believe it um, I, I don't know that we have that evidence, and I think that if there were that kind of evidence there, that people nowadays would try to uh, not say too much about it, because all it does is embroil what they have to say in a controversy, uh, and uh, unnecessarily in that regard, so I doubt that it's going to be easy to find the evidence. Maybe we'll find it uh, later. Uh, somebody should do a survey, I think, and ask how many of those people, A, believed in intelligent design, and B, um, uh, were doing this on the basis of their theory, or whether it was just, uh, I wonder what's out there, how much of it is there. Were they totally surprised by what they found? If the experiment had been done 10 years ago instead of now, would we be able to find the same stuff, or did it happen as soon as, uh, um, a as soon as we got the technology to be able to test for the, uh, uh, for the processes that we were talking about. Um, I, I don't know the answer to that. Um, I do know that uh, there is good evidence that uh, some prominent people in the uh, scientific community and those who had most of the voices uh, were saying quite loudly that most DNA was in fact not useful. Uh, evolutionary remnants, perhaps something that would be used later on, uh, whereas uh, uh, most intelligent design people felt that the estimate of 5% functional DNA was uh, severely lowballing it. There was somebody over there first. Oh, okay. Um, if we imagine from like A to Z, uh, let's say where there's nothing created in the universe and then Z would be life on Earth, um, it seems like the intelligent designers are saying, see all of these things that could not have happened without an intelligent designer. Um, and the evolutionists are saying, well, because we're here at Z with life and complexity and so on, they did happen without God, without even being open to the possibility of there being God as the designer. Well, if you, if you take as a given that there is no God, 
then you're basically forced into that position because we obviously are here. We're talking to each other. We're intelligent, so intelligence must be able to come from unintelligence. And in fact, you'll see a lot of argument of that very kind of thing. Uh, last week we were talking about the uh, uh, human degeneration and uh, the guy made a very good case from the mathematics of the situation that human intelligence is degenerating with time. And that raises the question, how did we get there in the first place? And uh, his answer basically was, well, we did, obviously, so there must be some explanation. And he made a, an attempt to try to give uh, an explanation that sounded pretty good. Uh, that's... Uh, those are what they uh, know in the business as just so stories. It's, it's as though the evolutionist starts at Z and looks at all of the complexities of life beyond Z and uses those as though they happened back here and somehow they're the proof for uh, the ability of nothing to make all this complexity. Well, we've actually seen an argument of that very kind of thing, where we talked about how bones can do things naturally that, uh, uh, but that's assuming that bones are natural to begin with. That's assuming that they didn't require intelligent design to begin with. And if, there, it's, if there's something designed into bones that makes that beautiful design, then of course the argument that, well, see what nature can do, kind of falls apart. Uh, Just one more thing. Um, last night I watched a, a DVD called Metamorphosis about the life of life cycle of the butterfly. It was produced by Biola University. Excellent. Um, it, it is beyond belief that all of the complexity in the life cycle of the butterfly could have happened by chance and not by intelligent design. And if you want an excellent 64-minute video or DVD color, um, all the top scientific approaches and equipment, yeah. um, including you know, electron microscopes and so on, would be uh, worth the while of this audience to look at it. Uh -huh. and, and by the way, I might remark one more time on the, on the uh, arch that you referred to. You will notice that arches of that kind don't occur in nature naturally. Um, that that uh, the scaffolding itself requires intelligent design at present. Now, uh, could there be a hill on which a bunch of rocks sat and then the hill dissolved under and the rocks? Uh, it's theoretically possible. We haven't seen any of those. We do see where there are natural arches of rock that are solid rock and you dissolve the rock out underneath. And that is apparently done without uh, intelligent design. Um, so an arch per se is not direct evidence of intelligent design. Um, the, uh, but the idea of having fitted stones, uh, at a certain point you think, you know, if you run across one of these, you think that somebody did it, the Romans or somebody else. The, um, in, in looking at the argument about where does science go from here and so forth, uh, two points. One, I don't think you could get an honest survey of the people that did the ENCONE part because their funding may be affected by that and they would be very hesitant in the criticism and there's plenty of evidence for severe criticism and loss of job and loss of tenure, et cetera, based on um, even mentioning the intelligent design in certain communities. So that I don't think you could get an honest survey on that. It would be interesting, but I don't think you'd get an honest survey. But in terms of where does science go from here, it reminds me of my grandfather laughing at me trying to irrigate teaching me to farm and I'd run the water the wrong way and he'd tease me and say I'd have to join a certain church in order to get the water to run uphill because it just doesn't happen very often. But if it reminds me of we've got lots of evidence for things that appear to be intelligently designed and we keep going back saying but we and we don't have very good evidence for things randomly happening it kind of reminds me that if I 
assume that it works better running downhill, I can feed a whole lot more people than if I keep waiting to prove once I can get, that I actually can get it to run uphill once and feed the people. So I don't think science is inhibited by accepting the fact that there may be intelligent design and considering that, as well as considering whether it's, it, it evolved. I, don't, I, I think you actually limit yourself by not allowing yourself to consider that there may be a design behind this and therefore if we look for the design we'll find more information. It doesn't. They try and paint it like your video that it's inhibiting creative thought in the United States by having all these adults believe in creationism and we shouldn't allow our children to do that. Well that certainly hasn't been true in the past and it usually doesn't limit one's ability to solve a problem by considering all the variables. Let's see. Did you want to talk? Yeah. Okay. And then you're next. Yeah, I'd like to say, first of all, that when he said on the end of your video, you need to re remind us of what A, B, and C or whatever is, is valid. I, I agree with that. My question is, who is the video aimed at? Is it aimed at people like us? Is it aimed at scientists? Is it aimed at people sitting on the fence? So who's your audience for the video that you're making? The audience needs to include uh, scientists at least. So it, I don't feel comfortable dumbing it down more than so much. Yeah, I'm not suggesting dumbing it down. Uh, I'm just wondering what your target is. But, uh, but the, the, uh, the, target, the target audience, uh, I, I aim to make it as wide as possible and so that uh, so that people who let's say are high school students would be able to listen to it, understand the basic message, and take it away and uh, be able to uh, find it useful in their own lives as they're trying to struggle with the the issue of intelligent design. Um, but at the same time, I do know that uh, if if you make serious missteps. Uh, then you open yourself up to somebody pointing out how stupid it is and therefore uh, all the work that you did in bringing people to accept intelligent design as a live option uh, will then go down the drain along with not only your credibility but the credibility of your side. You see, that's what they always do. It sounds good but it's not really true. And that's why I have to be scrupulously careful to be completely or as completely accurate as we can be at this point. Um, a comment, a comment on negative evidence. Uh, the reason that archaeologists can, at least in their minds, confidently identify arrowheads that they find in the ground is because they believe that there is no physically or chemically occurring geologic process that naturally produces them. So in a sense, that's an argument based from negative evidence. Were there to be some such discovery of a naturally occurring geological um, mechanism, then we might have to re-argue our knowledge of early man. Uh, because it's, it, it's all based on the assumption that these cannot be produced naturally. So it, you do and, and use arguments of, of negative evidence. And are much cruder than standard arrowheads. You know, yes. the cutting stones Yes, uh, will have two or three chips out of them, and you're going, really? And they'll say, yeah, because that's not something that's natural. Um, I think it's important that uh, both sides, the naturalists and those who embrace intelligent design, as we discussed, are very careful. Um, you know, back in the mid-80s and in the blind watchmaker, Dawkins points out, well, the human eye, you know, appears to be poorly designed if it was. I'm not saying this is the case, but someone could have taken that to go, okay, it's just a product of evolution, doesn't seem to make sense, let's move on. And then back, you know, 15, 20, year, 20 years in the future, we come to find out, you know, there's the, the Mueller-Galil cells. Uh, something we didn't know about before, and then we go, well, no, maybe this could make sense in the framework of a design. On the other hand, uh, those in the intelligent design camp could also say, well, we're not sure how this happens. Fill it in with a God of the Gaps argument. It's just the way it was designed, 
and completely disregard some naturalistic explanation for that. So we have to be careful, and especially in the forensic sciences, we talked a little bit about that. The tendency is to infer to an intelligence, but we can't get so focused on that that uh, we rule out an accident, you know, something that did happen by accident. So I think both sides really are susceptible um, to doing that, to allowing uh, their common practice or a dogma to sneak in and kind of skew the evidence. So I think it's important to be open-minded. Even if someone embraces intelligent design, we can't completely discard naturalistic causes and, and vice versa. At this point, uh, before our next question, I'll point out that it's one minute before 11.30, and I know some of you have to be elsewhere. And thank you for uh, staying. Uh, for those of you who want to stay and make comments, uh, you're certainly welcome to do so. We haven't checked all the authorities. We haven't asked the theologians. Um, CNN yesterday, Pat Robertson said, evolution is the, th the thing because of the fossils and radiocarbon dating. So here's who, a theologian. Who said that? Pat Robertson. So things have changed. I remember, wasn't it in the 60s that theologians pronounced that God was dead? And I forget what evidence was offered for that, but it swept through the theological community. It was quite exciting. And I assume if he was dead then, he's probably still dead. Well, this could all be a hallucination. That would be the usual assumption, but uh, according to history, that didn't work one time. So maybe, uh, <laughs> on the other hand, uh, there's the T-shirt the that's put out, and it says, God is dead, Nietzsche, and then below it, it says, Nietzsche is dead, God. <laughs> so, <laughs> so maybe, um, maybe some of the theologians who said that didn't know what they were talking about. Uh, I think that this is good evidence for intelligent design. I think it would be nice sometime to say, uh, and maybe we'll do some of this during the Sabbath School discussions, Let's assume that intelligent design is really true. Where do we go from there? And I think that what happens is that we fairly rapidly transition into a, uh, a strong suspicion that theism is right. And that's exactly what's driving the opposition to this kind of thing. It's not really a matter of what the evidence is. It's just fascinating because the claim is, and, and now I didn't say for life itself, because we haven't actually reproduced life. So we don't know that an intelligent designer can do that. Although we kind of all suspect that probably one will someday or other. Um, uh, except for those who believe that Ellen White was right when she said that uh, life is the prerogative of God alone. So maybe. Uh, we won't get there after all. Um, but, uh, but it was quite fascinating to read um, or to listen to Richard Dawkins uh, in his comments during uh, the movie Expelled, where he talked about, yeah, aliens are a possibility, an intriguing one, um, just as long as they arose by processes that are natural. And I think that exposes the real root of what's going on. The fight, in fact, when I presented this on the internet, the fight is never over, well, you've got your data wrong, uh, or if it is, it's very quickly quelled. I don't, that's why I was very careful about what I said, you see, because I avoid a lot of the controversies that are there, because I know where the pitfalls are and where some of the bodies are buried. And I deliberately tried to stay in the high ground on this. Um, but as soon as those little smoke screens are gone, uh, the immediate thing that comes out, well, well, what kind of a designer are you talking about? Well, let's accept the evidence for what it is, not for what it might lead to. You know, it's very much like you come across a person who uh, has his head severed and it's in a freezer in the basement and he's laying in the living room. Um, I, I think he died by intelligent design. 
um, <laughs> simply because there aren't a lot of natural processes that will do that, you know. But there's going to be a certain amount of resistance if your brother is the only person who had access to the home during the time. Because then you're starting to talk about some implications that are not very nice. My brother would never do that. He just wouldn't. See? And so then the hunt for other causes starts to gain a great deal of, of uh, uh, strength. And that's really what's going on. Uh, and that's really where all that re resistance is coming from. It's a basically an anti-theological, or at least an anti-interventionist theological uh, agenda. Well, most of you have seen the, the expelled video. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the last quote out of Dawkins is just priceless, where he's asked, you know, well, where did the first cell come from? And he says, well, maybe aliens dropped it off. And it's like, once you open that door, it's like, well, which alien, God or the, your spaceship? Or but then, but then he quickly says they had to evolve somewhere else. So he recognizes the problem of his position, and the ideology supersedes the scientific endeavor. And there's where science is limited. On either side, as he made a point earlier, if your ideology supersedes your ability to objectively look at the data, you inhibit science. And I don't think God's afraid of us objectively looking at the evidence. Um, it took me a while, because I'm at the fringes of this very fascinating subject, to catch on to what you were saying by the long string. Um, but I think you're saying that intelligent design scientists can replicate, or at least one of them, can replicate this long string. But evolutionists can't replicate this long string, or can't show how nature by itself would have replicated this long string. Is that what you're saying? That's close. Um, I think Crane Venter would be very upset if you were to call him an intelligent design theorist. Um, but, uh, but it fits your argument. But, but, it, it, but intelligent designers can do it, whereas nature by itself, uh, we haven't even gotten DNA let alone long strings of DNA, let alone long complex strings of DNA that you can put into a cell and make them run. Okay, so there was one other little thing I wanted to mention. Last week I was at the Roy, or not Roy, the Branson Sabbath School class in the Centennial Building, and uh, Dr. Butka was reading her poetry, and someone, also a Butka, some relative, stood up and talked about one of the Butka relatives in China he was in such high esteem by the Chinese that they brought to him a corpse that was headless. Someone held the head, the other person held the body, persons held the body, and they asked him to please reattach the head to the body. They were sure he could do it because he had been such a wonderful doctor for all of their ailments. <laughs> Good luck with that. <laughs> I, I, you could attach it, that'd be no problem. The question is making it work afterwards. <laughs> well, is it, I, guess, I guess if that's it for now, uh, welcome uh, next week to uh, uh, Ariel Roth and the Grand Canyon and probably the most up-to-date presentation you're going to get on it. And uh, then the week after that, and then we'll be going into the Sabbath School lesson uh, if everything proceeds as planned.